Where are you from? I'm from a small town <laughs> right between um, Austin and Houston, LaGrange, Texas. Can you imagine a class like this ever existing in your small town? I cannot. When history books are written about the times we're living in, what do you think they'll say? Will our generations be known for making a way for freedom? Our great debates? What will they say about a regular man named George whose death made an extraordinary impact? It's impossible to know how history will judge us while we're still living within the pages of those books that haven't been printed. But one thing is certain, we can't wait for those books to exist before talking about how we teach America's history to our students, a history shaped by things like systemic racism and the unforgivable crime against humanity known as slavery. On, uh, this quote of his, which I love as a historian, right? American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever written about it. So I think we get a glimpse of that in here, right? Because this is an odd place to, to talk about and think through and think about the totality of American history. This is Dr. Charles McKinney. He challenges his students to have those difficult conversations. He's a history professor at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. And we've all just enrolled in his 8 a.m. African-American history class at a largely white university. Today, we're learning about the Atlanta child murders. The Atlanta child murders, 29 black kids dead. Almost 40 years and he's still the same conniving, manipulative person that he's always been. Wayne Williams suspected, but never charged. What's going on in Atlanta right now reverberates back to 1619, right? This takes us back. This moment is shadowed by the weight, by the totality of American history. Is what you're teaching, what we just witnessed, is that an example of critical race theory? So this is the great thing about where we are, right, is it, you, there, there's a couple answers to this question, mm -hmm. right? Critical race theory is trying to ask the question, what does it mean to think about right, American institutions, to think about systems and structures having been directly impa impacted by race, race thinking? Right. Um, what does it mean to assume to to talk about um, the lens of race when we talk about the legal structures of our of our country, right? Economic and political and cultural structures. And so that's the lens that critical race theory is trying to you know is, is trying to open up for us. Um, so am I accessing critical race theory sort of explicitly in my history class? Um, probably, right. Um, but at the end of the day. Right. One of the things that I think gets lost in this debate is that there are a number of ways, right, for us to arrive at um, the conclusion that race is a central factor in American life. Um, so let's do this. We're going to break up and do some small groups. And um, I want you to think about I want you to think about these questions. Why do you believe or what do you hear when you hear the, the debates? What is scary about this, do you think? You know, the discomfort, that discomfort's not about critical race theory. Critical race theory is the Trojan horse being used, right, to launch larger, broader, I would say, launch larger, broader attacks on, on African-American history, on black history, on American history that, that is uncomfortable, right? That's hard history. That's stuff that makes people, you know, kind of squirm in their seats a little bit when they, when they see it. Right. And so that's kind of where that's kind of where we are. <laughs> that's something that I um, kind of struggled with in this class in the beginning is I kind of felt like this wasn't my history. And like, do I belong here? Like, is it OK that I'm here learning about this? And I think it's important for all students to be exposed to this history. The American dream only really applies to like what the upper class view as Americans. Relative silence means I think we're at the end of our, uh, I think we're at the end of small groups. These questions. Y'all, where'd, where'd, you, where'd you go? He keeps coming back to nothing has changed. Um, I feel like interviewers constantly try to say, well, um, well, how do you feel about all this change happening? Black people are still black people. 
And I think what he means by that is the history that white people want to um, put on them or prescribe them with, that has not changed. And white people are only more, becoming more rooted and ingrained in their thoughts about black people. The question, when is the appropriate time to start teaching children? Oh, OK, yeah, start thought, teaching yeah. children about race. Right. Why are, does it seem to be their ideologies completely missing each other in this discussion? Well, it's about who gets to be in the discussion. Why is the question ridiculous? Well, the question's ridiculous because the, the question assumes that everybody is having the same experience, that everyone in the room is white. And so since they're all white, they have the option. They don't have to grapple with race in ways that non-white people do. So the responses to that tweet were amazing, right? And so, you know, and I, I, I chimed in, too. Moving to Southern California from Missouri, age of seven, get to, you know, um, start hanging out with some of the kids on the street. You know, we're playing baseball and running around, and John's parents calls him, and, you know, he turns to me and says, bye, nigger, right, as he, is, as he, walks, back, as he walks back home. So I'm seven. So what, what, do you, what do you think, group of white people, that should happen right now, right? That we shouldn't talk about race until I get to high school? Right, until, until college? Right, until my first class on African American history? Right, so again, you know, when the default mode is, you know, rooms full of white parents, completely ignores the reality of the fact that there's millions of folks in this country who don't have the luxury of waiting so let's set aside that the question is ridiculous. People do ask it. How do you answer it? You know, what was, what was I supposed to do after, after this moment? You know, what, what kind of parents would I have had if I had gone in and told my mother and father what, what just happened? And they said, well, you know what, this is, this is inappropriate, right? We shouldn't talk about this. That's violent parenting, right? Something just happened. I know it's bad. I know it's a problem. And so what's the apparatus, right? So, you know, so, um, so Charles and Lil McKinney are supposed to deal with this sort of in the privacy of their own home. But John is never implicated in this, inter in, in this exchange, right? John or John's parents or the society that both little Chucky and John live in, right, in terms of the racial dynamics. And so some people have to grapple with these things, but apparently that grappling is supposed to take place in private while other people get the luxury, apparently, are supposed to have the luxury of determining and deciding, right, when they will confront this or when their children will have to talk about and deal with these issues in school. So an anti-racist curriculum is one that tells a fuller story. What do you think is the importance of telling that fuller story? Because we have all heard on the news of parents who are just fine with their kids learning the history that's out there and that's in textbooks already. First of all, um, why do we need it? We need it, first of all, because it's the truth. <laughs> it, that's, that's the really that's big start. reason. <laughs> and you know, it's a truth that we've only often, well, we've only recently uncovered. A lot of the scholarship of people like Dr. McKinney, for instance, has happened in the last 20, 25 years. The second reason though, is because it's good teaching. <laughs> The children sitting in our classrooms are not all Mayflower descendants. They're from all over the world. And even here in America, I mean, they are not that white suburban student anymore. And for students to do well, they need to feel that they belong. They need to feel included. And so it's good teaching. It's good practice to have a curriculum that includes the stories of everybody. One thing I noticed when chatting with a few of Professor McKinney's students is when they were speaking about the history they learned where they're from, they realized that where they're from, what that place looks like and how it makes them feel played a role in what they learned or didn't learn. And in the conversation of teaching an honest history, Professor McKinney says this is part of the problem. When I found out about George Floyd, it puts that one instance with all its gravity in a much broader context that is all the more horrifying because it's always been here as long as America's been here. It gets uncomfortable a lot. I think especially for me, I don't want to say the wrong thing. And so I think a lot of times I hold myself back um, from saying like what I'm really thinking and what I'm processing because I think oh, that might not be okay to say that might not be right. I don't think being uncomfortable is a bad thing at all. I've 
always really believed and been taught that like you should find comfort and discomfort because that's the only place that you grow. So if we're not having uncomfortable and difficult conversations, like how are we gonna grow and how are we gonna learn and how are we gonna move forward? I don't think you can fully understand any aspect of social, economic, or political life in America without coming to terms with the people whose backs those uh, institutions have been built upon. I want people to know that if you start to learn these things, um, like I've also been able to learn about black joy and about the way that people experience these moments when progress is actually made. And I think those moments kind of help drive me to learn more. It's only through an understanding of that history that we can hope to change it. How's this hit you? I mean, particularly now, right, in the age of, right, in the age of George Floyd, in the age of COVID, right? How does, how does, how does, how does reading this, how does it, how does this sit with you? It's just really interesting because in all honesty, this was not something I was taught in high school. Like I had no idea this, this has occurred and this is 28 murders. Like that's, that's a big deal. And I've noticed that when teachers teach race in an informed way, they always in some way check in with their students about how they feel about how they're learning. Why is that necessary? Because you don't want to do more harm than good. And so you have to check in with people and take care of their emotional well-being as well as their intellectual growth. Teachers are not just responsible for our cognitive development. They're responsible for managing a classroom of maybe 30 young people and ensuring that they feel comfortable in the class because learning can't happen when you feel like you're threatened. I make you kind of make you sad or confused, frustrated. Yes, you're nodding yes. Which one of those words are you nodding yes to? Um, it makes me kind of confused because uh, I always thought that integration was kind of like a good thing for like the black community. Yeah, right. All right. Good work, y'all. Good work. What is your goal for your students when they're done with one of your classes? Um, my goal for my students is to have them thinking critically about American history and about African American history in particular and being unafraid of, of the hard edges, but more importantly, being unafraid of the complexity um, and the contradictory tensions um, that we see uh, embedded in American history. As Du Bois used to say, sometimes we gotta live through paradox. We gotta live through, uh, we have to live through those contradictions um, in order to make meaning. Like a cowboy movie, right? You know, there's good guys and there's bad guys and there's a conflict and there's a resolution. Mm -hmm. Life is not like that. History is not like that. It's never been like that. And so we should stop pretending like it is.